Let us pray. O God, by whose word all things were made holy, pour out thy blessing on these creatures of flowers. Grant those who use them according to thy will and law and the spirit of thanksgiving may experience by thy power, health, and body, and protection and soul through the invocation of thy most holy name. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.
bless thee as full of the drink of grace. Thou who didst bear the power in it, we all bow low before thee. We invoke thee and end for thy name. Rescue us so holy and by the right of the Virgin from every necessity that presses upon us and from every temptation of the devil. Be our intercessor at the hour of death and judgment. Deliver us from the fire that never dies and from the outer darkness. Make us worthy of the glory of thy Son, O dearest and the most clement Virgin Mother. Thou art indeed our only hope, most sure and sacred in God's sight, to whom be honor and glory, majesty and dominion, forever and ever, even unto the ages of the ages. Amen. Yeah. 
On this wonderful Mother's Day, uh, the Canons wish to express our heartfelt love in the first place to our own mothers who may be watching. Um, they're certainly praying for us, as well as all of the mothers and families who come to the Priory, all of our friends and benefactors, mothers, all those whom we love and are praying for daily. Know that you are greatly loved and always in our prayers. Dearly beloved, today we celebrate the third Sunday after Easter. And in honor of the May crowning of Our Lady, it is fitting that we should preach about her on this solemn day. Since there are so many qualities and virtues pertaining to Our Lady that one could preach on, I will limit myself to the three mentioned by St. James 
today's epistle reading. He encourages us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. By way of an analogy, let us consider these three actions as expressions of the virtues of faith, humility, and patience. And then reflect on how Our Lady practiced these virtues to the highest degree. Let us start with the virtue of faith. It is a supernatural power of the soul, which, through the movement and help of God's grace, we believe what God reveals to us to be true, not because its intrinsic truth is evident through the natural light of reason, but due to the authority of God who reveals. What is more, this virtue of faith has two dimensions, objective and subjective. Objective faith concerns the formal objects of our faith, such as God and the truths that God has proposed for our belief. Subjective faith concerns the ascent of our intellect and wills to those formal objects. The virtue of faith is dependent upon hearing about it, as confirmed by St. Paul when he said to the Romans, Faith comes by hearing. Did Our Lady have the supernatural virtue of faith? Well, supernatural faith is both a gift infused by God into our souls, and a virtue insofar as the soul has to exercise itself, exercise itself in the practice of this gift. As an infused gift, St. Thomas teaches that God gives everyone grace, proportion, to the dignity for which he does destines him. Thus, considering faith as infused into Our Lady, we must remember that by her immaculate conception, Mary was not only conceived without original sin, she was also filled with every grace and virtue necessary to fulfill the dignity that God had granted to her in being chosen to be the Mother of God. That Our Lady was filled with all grace is evident from Gabriel's greeting at the Annunciation when he said to Mary, Hail, full of grace. That she was filled not only with infused faith, but all the other virtues to a heroic degree as well follows from her being filled with grace. Commenting on this, St. Thomas Aquinas says that whereas other saints excelled each in some particular virtue, the Blessed Virgin Mary excelled in all and is given as a model of all. With respect to Mary's intellectual faith, it is generally believed by theologians that she was given a certain infused knowledge concerning God's plan of redemption in general, as well as that found in the scriptures of the Old Testament. To this knowledge, Our Lady gave perfect assent of her intellect with heroic faith. St. Elizabeth bore witness to all this when she cried out to Mary at her visitation, Blessed is she that has believed, because the things promised her by the Lord shall be accomplished. Our Lady also grew in intellectual faith by asking God for greater enlightenment into the mysteries of salvation. An example is for asking the Archangel Gabriel how the mystery of the Incarnation was going to take place within her since she did not know man. Commenting on this, St. Ambrose says that Mary had read and believed the words of Isaiah, Behold, she shall conceive and bear a son. How this was to take place, she had not read, nor had it been revealed to any prophet, but only to her through the mouth 
of an angel. What is more, since as St. James says, faith without works is dead, it is fitting that Our Lady's intellectual faith, along with Our Lady's intellectual faith, she also gave perfect assent to it with her will as well. The loftiest example of this is her answer to Gabriel to establish a message. With heroic faith, Our Lady tenderly bows her head and answers, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. St. Thomas of Villanova said of this response, O powerful fiat, O efficacious fiat, O fiat to be venerated above every other fiat. For with a fiat, God created light, heaven, and earth. But with Mary's fiat, God became man like us. But Mary went much further than this. She should have submitted her will to God in everything. He proposed to her belief, even to embracing the cross of her son. As for us, even though we cannot imitate Our Lady as to infused faith, we can imitate her example of growing in subjective faith. Thus, by imitation of Our Lady during this continued time of exile from the sacraments, we can read God's Word with greater vigilance, asking Him for spiritual enlightenment in order to grow in intellectual faith. And since Mary embraced the cross of her Son with heroic submission, we should continue to bow our wills to God during this ongoing trial with the effects of this epidemic by making frequent and humble acts of faith, asking God to help us persevere through it. All this brings us to the next virtue of Our Lady, her humility. In the Gospels, Jesus encourages all of us to learn of me, for I am humble of heart. Since Mary was the grace necessary for being the mother of God, it follows that she had the virtue of humility to a heroic degree. Humility is that moral virtue which enables us to restrain the inordinate desire for our own excellence, while giving us a true evaluation of our smallness and misery before God. Based on self-knowledge, the humble soul sees himself as he is in the eyes of God. He does not exaggerate his good qualities, nor deny the gifts that he has received from God. The virtue of humility reveals two things about ourselves. The first is that whatever pertains to defect or imperfection belongs to us. The other is what, whatever belongs to goodness or perfection comes from God. In Mary, there are four spiritual effects in, in particular that we can see and strive to imitate. The first is, as St. James encourages us today, to be slow to speak. Being slow to speak is the opposite effect of that pride which tempts one to be either boastful or self-flattering. Humble Mary, on the other hand, is recorded as only speaking seven times in the Gospels. This is an outstanding example to us who speak incessantly while saying very, very little indeed. Mary's example to us is one of silent consideration of what others have said. After the shepherds visited her at the Lord, Lord's Nativity, Our Lady has kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Her being slow to speak leads us into the next effect of humility she practiced. She was always humble and never exalted herself. In a revelation to St. Matilda, Our Lady said she saw herself enriched with graces greater 
than all other creatures, but never preferred herself to any one of them. The third effect of humility in Mary is that she always referred praises given to her back to God. An example of this is when her cousin Elizabeth said to her, Blessed art thou among women. Our Lady, in response, answered with her uttering the Magnificat, My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. A last effect of humility in Mary is that she always served others. Thus, following perfectly in the footsteps of her divine Son, who said, I came not to be served, but to serve. Mary's examples of service to others are many. St. Bernard once said of Mary's great prerogatives, since we cannot imitate her virginity, let us at least imitate her humility. We can do this by pondering the present crisis allowed by God. Rather than complaining or speaking about the closure of the churches overly much, we can refer the graces we have received back to God and serve Him by helping those around us, especially the sick and the homebound. Let us look at the last virtue of Mary now under consideration, her heroic virtue of patience. It would not be an exaggeration to say that if we are asked what virtue we seem to lack almost daily, it is that of patience. Patience can be defined as that virtue which enables one to bear physical and moral sufferings without sadness or dejection of heart. Jesus encourages us as such when he tells us we will suffer persecution for his sake. In much patience, you will possess your souls. From a private revelation to St. Bridget, Our Lady tells us, As a rose grows up among thorns, so did I grow up amongst tribulations. That this was Our Lady's lot, old Simeon, at Jesus' presentation in the temple, told her, and a sword shall pierce thy own heart. As means for a deepening understanding of Our Lady's patience, we should frequently meditate on our seven sorrows, each of which helped to grow, helped her to grow in greater and greater the role of patience. Of those sorrows, the greatest is her standing at her son's cross in Calvary. St. Augustine says that the cross and the nails of the son were also those of his mother. With Christ crucified, the mother was also crucified. In fact, at the foot of the cross, Our Lady became the Queen of Martyrs by union with her son, the exemplar of martyrs. For us, there is never any lack of opportunities to grow in patience. We are helped in that by our daily interactions with our family members, co-workers, and fulfilling our daily duties. And right now, we have the constant irritation of the COVID phenomenon. Let us imitate the heroic patience of Mary. Therefore, beloved, on this fourth Sunday after Easter and the solemn occasion of Our Lady's May crowning, let us cry out to her with fervent prayers. May she help us to practice in a heroic degree not only her faith, humility, and patience, but all the virtues. Let us also ask her to help us be humble servants of the Lord, thanking God for all the numerous gifts and graces He bestows upon us and using them for His greater glory. 
Lastly, during these times of present trial, we must consider ourselves as present with Mary at the foot of the cross with Christ who is suffering in his members. Let us imitate the heroic patience by which she not only persevered in patience at the foot of the cross, but also unto the day of his glorious resurrection. Thus, let us go forward with not only the patience of her blessed mother, but also with her Easter joy. In this way, we will not only grow in union with Jesus in this valley of tears of spiritual joy, and persevere in patience onto that union with our blessed mother and all and our divine Jesus in that kingdom of unending joy, and this, beloved, even unto the ages of ages.
Thank you. 